Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, so yeah, my name is Lubna. I'm a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face. I'm working on uh, developing language models for code. So today I'm gonna tell you about a project that I've been involved in for the past year. It's called Big Code, and we're trying to build uh, strong code generation models and an open and responsible approach. So let's first start with some context. Probably the first thing that popped in your heads when I said code generation models is GitHub Copilot, this VS Code extension released by Microsoft, which is backed by a model by OpenAI called Codex, which basically auto-completes your code. And this was a very exciting moment in the code generation space, because there were some code models before that, but they were not very strong at code completion. For example, you have code GPT, code BERT, PL BART. These models were very small, less than 200 million parameters, and they were trained on little data, so they were not very good at completing your code. So when codecs were released, people were very excited, since OpenAI kind of showed that you can take a large language model and train it on, on a lot of code, and you get a strong code generation model. After that, DeepMind also released AlphaCode, which is uh, also a code generation model, but is more focused on uh, pro progr competitive programming. And then AWS uh, develops Code Whisperer, which is uh, similar to GitHub Copilot. So this is very exciting, but these models are not released. They, you can use them either via an API or you can just access them like AlphaCode. So although it was very exciting, these models were not open source, so you had to send, for example, your data to external APIs, and in some cases it is sensitive and you, you don't wanna do that. You also can not fine tune these models. So this is when the open source community tried to step in and started training some language models for code. For example, Code Pirates from Hugging Face, Polycoder, Encoder, CodeGen, and Code Geeks. So there was a lot of progress going on uh, with some kind of strong models. But there were still some open questions even after we had these models. For example, regarding performance, they were still not matching the performance of GitHub Copilot, especially when you go to other programming languages than Python. There were also questions about the transparency since most of these models didn't release their training data, so we don't really know what went in there during the training, and also some other questions about evaluation and user experience. So today I'm gonna tell you about how we try to solve some of these questions. And in particular at Hugging Face, how we went from Code Parrot, which was a, a small code generation model focused only on Python. It was trained on permissive data, but its performance was not very great since we released it as an educational tool with like a full pipeline on how to prepare code data sets and how to train with these models. And after that, a few months ago, we released StarCoder, which is a much stronger code generation model trained on more than 80 programming languages. And just like Code Pirate, we only used permissive data and the model is fully open access. So in this uh, short presentation, I'm gonna tell you a little bit how we went from Code Pirate to StarCoder with the help of the community. So first I'm gonna tell you about the big code community, then about the data sets preparation and the architecture, and finally how we evaluate these models. So this project uh, where we developed StarCoder, it was not just Hugging Face, it was the effort of a lot of people. So it's initially collaboration between Hugging Face and ServiceNow, but it's open, so we have participants, more than 500 participants from all over the world. I think we have more than 30 countries represented, and basically anyone can join. You can join our Slack channel, our Hugging Face organization, and start to contribute. So a lot of people helped uh, make this uh, model. Uh, and the motivation behind Big Code was to try to address some of the challenges today of closed large language models development. And this starts with not releasing the training data. The uh, sources are not disclosed, so we don't really know what these models were trained on. And then the model weights are not public, so you can't fine tune your, this, these models for your own use case. And as I said, you have to send your data to an external API, which is not very secure. And needless to say that this makes these results not reproducible. So what we think at Big Code, open large language model development should look like is exactly the opposite of all of that. You should make your training data public with inspection tools and opt out. If people don't want to be in your training, they should have the right to do so. 
Uh, the model weight should also be public for fine tuning and for adapting to specific use cases. And this should also allow for on-premise deployment so you don't have to send your data to third parties. And all of this process should be well documented, well documented so people can kind of reproduce your results. So this is what we try to address in Big Code. And now let's go into the technical details of how do we train these models. We all know it's like hundreds of GPU hours and terabytes of data, but it's not just that. There's a lot of things that go behind the scenes. So I'm going to tell you about StarCoder, which is named after Star Wars and released on May 4th, um, and how we train this and develop the data set and everything until like the release. For the data, we need to have more data, but also better quality data. Regarding the more, if you follow the trend of large language models development, you probably noticed a shift in the size of these models. So uh, starting from June 2020, people were releasing very large models, for example, like GPT-3, which was 175 billion parameters, also like OPT and Bloom, which were also very large, and they were trained on very little data, for example, 300 billion tokens. Well, very little, not that little. But if you see now, for example, we have Llama, which is 7B, and it is trained on one trillion token. So what happened between GPT-3 and Llama? So first, OpenAI released the Kaplan scaling laws, which tell you if you have a fixed compute budget, for example, I can use 500 GPUs for a month, you can just blindly start training a model. You need to decide what, what model size makes sense and what size of the training data you should use. So these scaling laws kind of tell you for a fixed compute budget, you should have a model this size and you have a data set this size. This way you will optimally use your compute. So at the point with the Kaplan uh, scaling laws, they said if you have more compute, you should make your model much larger, but your data sets, you don't need to make it that larger. But then DeepMind released the Chinchilla scaling laws, which said that these uh, laws were not completely right, and you should uh, scale your data as much as you scale your model. So this was when we had, for example, the Chinchilla model, which was 60 billion parameters, which was trained on 1.6 trillion tokens. So yeah, that's when we knew that we actually needed much more data than we did before. And one thing that is interesting after that, for example, for the Llama model, if you take it in the chinchilla plot, you'll find that 7 billion parameters doesn't need 1 trillion tokens to be compute optimal. So people were like, oh, why did Meta train Llama that much longer? Uh, is uh, the chinchilla scaling laws wrong? And that's not actually the point because these laws kind of tell you what is the compute optimal point, but they don't tell you that this choice is optimal because one thing you need to add is inference. The larger your model will be, the harder it will be to use it in inference. So sometimes you're probably better paying a compute overhead during training and paying a little bit more to have a much smaller model that you can easily start in inference. Just, this is when people started to make in models smaller, but training them longer so they have like a strong model that is easy to serve in inference. And this is why we now find like 3B models that are trained on like more than a trillion tokens. And this is kind of common practice now. Um, okay, so now we saw that like we need to have more data, but we also need to have better quality data. Uh, and this helps a lot with like the performance. I'm gonna talk about how we develop StarCoder data, which is the training data set of our model. So we started from the stack, which is a data set that we released a year ago. It's the largest collection of permissive code from GitHub. It has more than six terabytes of data, and it has more than 300 programming languages. We also have an inspection tool where you can go, you can type your GitHub username, and it will tell you if you have any of your repositories in our data. If you want to be removed, you can just fill a form, and we will remove your data from future model trainings. So uh, we had the stack, and then these are the tools I talked about where you can check if your repositories are there, and you can opt out if you want. And from the stack, we went to start coder data. So we trained on 800 gigabytes of code in 86 programming languages, and we also added GitHub issues, Jupyter Notebooks, and Git commits. So the question that asks itself is like, how did we go from six terabytes to 800 gigabytes? And the answer is data curation. We did a lot of data cleaning to make sure that the data we train our models on is actually gonna help it understand how to code. 
First thing we did is language selection. So we only selected 86 programming languages based on popularity and also trying to remove the languages that are no longer maintained or configs. And we added other sources like GitHub issues, for example, someone opens an issue and then there's a conversation because we were hoping that the model could, for example, help you uh, uh, fix bugs and uh, issues that you might encounter during programming. And we also added Jupyter notebooks, which we found were of a very good quality. After that, we did a lot of data inspection. So for each programming language, we took 100 random files and we asked people to kind of look at them and flag if they find any outliers. And we also had some filters, for example, to remove auto-generated files, for example, based on the line of uh, the average line length. But sometimes you need to adapt the thresholds to each programming language, which needed some manual inspection. After that, the uh, other filter that we applied in which gave a huge performance boost was uh, near duplication. So in the stack, since it is like repositories from GitHub, sometimes you can have duplicates. So files that are exactly similar were already removed, but you could still have some files that are kind of near duplicates. For example, two functions that are exactly the same, but use different variable names. So it's still the same function doing the same purpose. So we call this near duplicates. And we found that removing them from the training data uh, boosts the performance uh, a lot. So for example, here you can see in this table, near dedupe is when we applied this deduplication and none is when we didn't. And you can see that there's like a performance gain to doing it. It's also a good filter because you don't need to adapt it to each of your 80 programming languages. It's uh, language agnostic. And if you're uh, wondering how does that work, we use an algorithm called mean hashing, which kind of tries to have a numerical representation for each uh, file. And then LSH, which clusters files that are similar together. And then inside each cluster, you decide which files to drop and which files to keep. And this way you have less duplicates in your training data. After the duplication, we did the uh, removal of personal identifiable information. Because believe it or not, people are pushing their API keys to GitHub, SSH keys, names, and usernames. So we try to remove that from the training data so that during inference model doesn't spit out these secrets. To do that, we trained an encoder model called the star PII on the task of named entity recognition. And we detected these entities and we masked them. After that, the last step in curation was data decontamination. Because uh, if you're gonna evaluate on a test set, you don't want to be training on it. There will be data leakage and it will not reflect the real performance of your model. So we removed all the test sets that we were planning to evaluate on from our training data. After that, we did some data formatting to, for example, for special data like git commits, we have the file before the commit and the file after and then the commit message. So we kind of concatenated them and used special tokens so that the model would know it is in the git commits mode. We did the same for Jupyter Notebooks. Since you have a markdown cell, a code cell, and an output cell, we concatenated them with special tokens. For example, here you can see that you can use a star coder as a Python interpreter. You say Jupyter code, and you give some code. You give, you say Jupyter output, and it tries to predict what the output of the code will be, which is pretty cool because you don't need to do any fine tuning to get that. So that was data. Uh, now let's see architecture. The motivations for the architecture of StarCoded were, StarCoder were motivated by these few questions. So it's a decoder model like GPT-2, uh, but it has some tweaks. Uh, for example, for the size, we aimed for 15 billion parameters and we added some code optimizations in the transformers integration to get some fast inference. We also used multi-query attention and it is a technique where you have, uh, for example, in your transformer head, you have different heads. And the idea of multi-query attention is instead of having different keys and values in each head, you just have the same set of values. And this means that your tensors will be uh, much smaller, which reduces uh, the memory footprint. And it enables you to process much larger batches faster. The other choice was to the context length. So we have 8,000 tokens in the context length of StarCoder. And this was possible thanks to flash attention. And the last change we did is uh, fill in the middle because the model is a decoder, so it can only process text from left to right, 
Meaning if you just take a decoder model and for example, you have some code and let's say you have a function and you wanna add a doc string in the middle, your model will only be see what's on the left and it will not see the rest of the function. And this is a feature we wanted to add, the fact that you would be able to edit your code in the middle. So we use this transformation where you take your training data and you swap the order of your uh, text and this enables you to have this feature without changing the objective in the training. So yeah, that was what I said about MQA. You have different heads and you share the keys and values uh, across all of them. And we found that this gives a very small performance degradation. So we thought it was very worth keeping this feature. Now people also use GQA, which is like instead of having one uh, set of keys and values, you ha they have like eight uh, uh, values for them. Regarding the training setup, we trained StarCoder for on uh, 500 GPUs on the Hugging Face cluster. We use 3D parallelism and we trained for one trillion tokens. So in our training data, we didn't have one trillion unique tokens. We had around 250. So we decided to train for multiple epochs. Uh, there were some studies that showed that you can train up to four or five epochs without performance degradation. And uh, if we learned something from the scaling laws is that like training 15 billion model uh, on less, uh, for example, 200 billion tokens, it would be very undertrained, which is why we did multiple epochs. And the training took 24 days and it was kind of a smooth sailing. We didn't have uh, to do like uh, any manual intervention. The jobs were restarted automatically sometimes, which is why you have different colors in the loss. Uh, but this was handled by the cluster. And for the training, we used Megatron LM. Uh, so this is the family tree of the models we released. So StarCoder base is the base model that we trained on one trillion tokens. After that, we fine-tuned on Python, which was like the same Python pre-training set to get StarCoder. So StarCoder base and StarCoder are like the, our base models. After that, we tried to do some experiments, for example, taking StarCoder base and training it on more natural language. Because when we took StarCoder base and we prompted it with like English, it was able to respond, apparently thanks to training on Markdown in HTML. So we were wondering what would happen if we took this model and we further trained it on Wikipedia and web data set, for example, the refined web with data from Falcon. To do that, we got StarCoder Plus, which was much better at natural language than StarCoder Base. And we did some instruction tuning to get like chat assistants, for example, StarChat Alpha and StarChat Beta. So these are the models that were released by Big Code. And after that, it's not just a family tree, it became a Big Code ecosystem. Uh, you can see that here we have the stack data set and you can either have community fine tunings, people take a star coder and instruction tune it. That's how we got wizard coder, pangu coder too, for example, or people just take the stack and they pre-train new models. So these are all models that were pre-trained on the stack, stable code, cogen 2.5, replete model and desi coder. And then we have some other models from the big code community like Octocoder, which is an instruction tuned version of StarCoder based on Git commits data. So it's really nice to see that people are kind of adopting these tools and see what happens when you open source your data and you open source these models. You kind of help the community speed the things up and release very cool things. Uh, so that was it for training and for uh, architecture. Uh, now let's see how we evaluate these models. So if you think uh, of language models, they generate text. The, usually the way we, gener we evaluate them is we have some benchmarks and we have candidate solutions and we kind of compare what the model generated to the candidate solution using metrics like blue. Uh, but if you do that for code models, it's not really gonna work. Since you, there, the space of solutions is very large, just think of how many ways you can sort a list. You have so many algorithms. So if you just try to compare your generation to a reference solution, it doesn't uh, fairly uh, evaluate your model. So that's when we use unit tests and functional correctness. So you have a benchmark, for example, called human eval, where you have uh, function signatures and doc strings, and you ask your model to complete your code. And then you take this completion and you evaluate it against unit tests, and you see which solutions pass and which solutions don't. And and then you kind of compute the average. So here is a table of uh, human eval performance. So pass at one is like the metric that we use. And you can see a comparison of open access based models 
and uh, closed access models. And for example, Starcoder Base 15B is the strongest open access model with 33.6 plus at one. And you can see that there's Octocoder and Wizard Coder, which are based on Starcoder and instruction tuned versions, which uh, for example, get 58 plus at one, which is amazing. And um, so the, these are some results. There are new models released now, like for example, Code Llama that I'm gonna show in another table, which shows that the field is moving like really fast. Uh, yeah, and we have like a leaderboard to compare these code models. So if you're interested in seeing how uh, code models currently perform on different programming languages, you can go there and you can find the evaluation on uh, 13 programming languages. So yeah, as I said, the field is moving super fast. So there were a lot of models that were released last week based on Code Llama by Meta, which are very strong base models. And uh, people also try to instruction tune them. So now you can see that Starcode is probably there at a bit uh, in the middle of the table. So it's very cool to see that people are releasing new open source models and the community are, is doing its best to instruction tune them and try to bridge the gap to closed models like GPT-4 and ChatGPT. Uh, so for evaluation, we released two tools, the Big Code Evaluation Harness, which is a unified framework for evaluating these models, because sometimes it's not very obvious how to evaluate them. Uh, so here I only showed human eval, but it is not the only benchmark that we evaluated on. We also evaluated on DS1000, which is more comprehensive, and also on MBPP and multi-PLE on different programming languages. So it's very important to test your model on, very, on a lot of benchmarks. In case there was some contamination with one of them, you can still have a much more comprehensive overview of what your model is capable of. And uh, yeah, as I said, there's also a leaderboard for like uh, to promote producibility of these models because sometimes people report some numbers and people can't reproduce them. So if you have one place where you can check these scores and where you know that all the models were evaluated the same way, we believe this can further pro uh, foster transparency and reproducibility. Um, now we can see, let's see some code completion tools that were released either by Big Code or by the community. So we released with the model VS Code extension to make it uh, easier to use. And one cool feature in this VS Code extension is this uh, membership testing. Since in Big Code, we really try to put a lot of effort in data governance. So we only trained on permissive data. Uh, but even if you take code that has permissive license like MIT or Apache 2, it's uh, not enough to just release a model like that. You should have some code attribution tools. Because if the model generates some code that is copied verbatim from the training data, uh, people using that code should be able to attribute the original author. So this is why in the VS Code extension, if you turn this feature on and the model generates code that was copied from the training, it kind of flags it and says this code was a copy of the training. If you wanna see the original repository of this code, you can go to this link. And this is where you click go to stack search. It gives you details about like this or the repository of this code, its license, its author, etc. if you want to give attribution. So we have a VS Code Club plugin. We have also a Jupyter plugin, which is a Chrome extension. And you can use Starcoder on uh, the Jupyter notebooks and then we have a Vim plugin and an Emacs plugin and a JetBrains and VS Code plugins by the refactor.ai team. Uh, so yeah, some of these were by Big Code, the others were by the community and uh, there are very different ways to test SAR coder. For example, the VS Code extension now also supports the Code Llama models so you can give it a try if you want. It's also open source if you want to contribute and try to help us build it since our goal is to release more models and not very focused on the products. So yeah, if uh, you're interested, feel free to open a PR and add new features. Regarding the license of uh, the models, we release them under CodeML OpenRail. Uh, it is a royalty-free access and uh, you can use the model for commercial purposes and also distribute derivatives. The only restrictions are ethical. For example, you can't use the model for malware generation. Other than that, if you don't plan to do, choose in, to do anything non-ethical, it should be free to go. And it is an improved version of OpenRail that was used for Bloom uh, that uh, makes commercialization easier. 
there's an agreement on the big code space if you want to check for more details. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is how to deploy large language models for code since we get asked this question a lot, especially for companies that want to serve the model. So 15 billion parameters can still be like, uh, it still needs uh, some GPUs to serve fast. For example, if you're a company and you wanna deploy your own version of GitHub Copilot and serve a lot of users, how can you do that? Since at Hugging Face, we're serving the model through an inference endpoint and uh, we're also serving it for the VS Code. So some challenges that come are with the model size. As I said, 15 billion parameters might still be hard to kind of deal with, and you need to do a lot of optimizations, and you need to make sure the user experience is smooth. You don't want your server to crash. You wanna optimize for both latency and throughput. So first, there's the inference and points from Hugging Face, where you can, uh, there's a free and uh, a paid version, and you just have an endpoint that you can query and we take care of the deployment on multiple GPUs. And then there's uh, the text generation inference library. So this is the library that's used by inference in production at Hugging Face. It serves most of the popular models like Falcon, Llama, Galactica, and Starcoder. And it has some features like tensor parallelism for large models, token streaming where you can generate tokens one by one. You don't have to wait for the full generation to complete. It is also production ready and it has a lot of optimizations in the back end. Uh, some users of text generation inference are Hugging Chat, uh, this uh, platform where we serve chat models like the Open Assistant model, Code Llama 34B, Instruct, and Falcon 180B. Uh, it is also used in the VS Code extension where we're serving Code Llama and Starcoder. Uh, it was used by the Open Assistant team and by uh, not the dev. Uh, finally, there's a solution for those interested where uh, Tagging Face, they take care of the end-to-end -end deployment of a version, uh, local, an on-prem version of GitHub Copilot where uh, the team can train uh, a Starcoder model on your uh, local code base and build the VS Code extension or JetBrain, whatever you use for you. So it's kind of an end-to-end -end solution for having your on-prem code, code assistant. Uh, 